Do you want to learn about the United States Bill of Rights? Then you're in the right place. Hi, this is Parker from Desk Prep Champions, and in this video I'm going to give you a basic social studies lesson on the United States Bill of Rights. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please click subscribe down below. So my purpose in making this video is to give you both an introduction and an overview to the United States Bill of Rights. And I'm going to teach you the main and most important points that you need to know to do well on a test like the GED exam or in a social studies class. So let's start off by talking about the United States Constitution. Why? Well, the Bill of Rights is the first, attend first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Now, I have a separate video where we look at the Constitution more closely, and I'll link to that down below. But you should know that the Constitution creates a system of government that puts the power in the hands of the American people. And the Constitution is a document that states the goals of the nation as the Founding Fathers envisioned them, and it was signed on September 17, 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at a place that's now called Independence Hall. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is the city where the movie Rocky was filmed and where Rocky takes place. So the Constitution was a major accomplishment. However, there were two things that it lacked that created a heated debate that lasted for several years after the Constitution was originally written. And the Constitution lacked specific guarantees of personal liberty. Now, it also lacked specific limits on government power. And as I said, this created a very tense debate between two different groups. Now, one of those groups is what we call the Federalists. And Federalists essentially believe that the Constitution was fine the way that it was. They believed that adding a Bill of Rights was not necessary. So the Federalists opposed adding a Bill of Rights. Now, we also have the Anti-Federalists. And the Anti-Federalists wanted to add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. So one of the major advocates for adding a Bill of Rights was Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson was one of the American founding fathers, and he's probably most famous for being the main author of the Declaration of Independence. He was also the third U.S. president, and before he was the third United States president, Thomas Jefferson served as the first U.S. Secretary of State under President George Washington. And as I said, Thomas Jefferson was a major advocate for adding a Bill of Rights. And he said this, A Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse. And what no just government should refuse. Very powerful words from Thomas Jefferson. So let's look at the other side of the story here. So Alexander Hamilton was another American founding father, and he can be thought of as the father of the U.S. financial system because he was the first U.S. Secretary of the Treasury under President George Washington. Now, Alexander Hamilton took a different view. He was opposed to the Bill of Rights, and in the Federalist Number 84, which was written by Hamilton, he states the following. He says, I go further and affirm that Bills of rights, in the sense and in the extent in which they are contended for, are not only unnecessary in the proposed Constitution, but would even be dangerous. Why, for instance, he goes on to say, should it be said that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed? In other words, what he means here is that the Constitution doesn't give the government the power to restrict the press. So why do we need to state it directly in an addition to the Constitution? What's the purpose in doing that when there is no power given to the government to restrict the freedom of the press right now? So as we can see here, we see that there were two different sides that had two different arguments for whether or not a Bill of Rights should be added. But as you probably have guessed by now, the United States Bill of Rights was eventually created. And so the Bill of Rights was created on September 25th, 1789, and then later ratified on December 15th, 1791. So as I mentioned, the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and we're going to look at each one of them right now, and it's very important to understand these. So one of the most important and really the First Amendment here is the First Amendment that gives the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to petition, and freedom of assembly. So what do each of these things mean? 
Well, the freedom of speech gives us the right to express our opinions without punishment. And the freedom of religion is basically the freedom that says that the government can't establish an official church and they can't force you to worship their religion. You're free to practice whatever religion you want without punishment, or if you're not religious, that's fine too. You will not be punished for your religious views or your lack thereof. That's the freedom of religion. And also we see the freedom of the press. And this basically means that any kind of communications through media, whether it's through books, TV, radio, whatever the medium happens to be, there cannot be punishment for it. And so we also have the freedom to petition and the freedom of assembly. So the freedom to petition basically means that you can make complaints or you can compile a list of grievances, things that you don't like or things that you wish the government could change. You can make a list of grievances and give it to the government. Also, the freedom to assemble or the freedom of assembly means that you can come together with a group of people to express your beliefs. So basically you have the right to peacefully protest. So these are freedoms that are protected by the Constitution and the First Amendment here. So let's look at the text. So it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. All right, so let's move on to the Second Amendment. So the Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms, and this is the individual's freedom to own firearms. So let's look at the text. So the Second Amendment reads, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Moving on now to the Third Amendment. So the Third Amendment might sound a little bit funny because this isn't something that we usually think about in modern times. But the Third Amendment re places restrictions on quartering soldiers without consent. So to really understand this, we have to think about the historical context. So before and even during the American Revolutionary War, the British government had required Americans to provide British soldiers with food and housing. Now, after the American colonists won the Revolutionary War, that they fought against Great Britain, they wanted to make sure that they could never be required to be responsible for housing and feeding soldiers again, and thus we see the Third Amendment was added to the Constitution. So again, this is not something that we think too much about in modern times, but that's what the Third Amendment does, and here's the, here it is straight from the Bill of Rights. It says, No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house, without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Moving on now to the Fourth Amendment. So essentially what the Fourth Amendment does is it protects you against unreasonable searches and seizures. So basically it means that the police cannot enter your home to search for evidence of a crime without having a warrant. Now there are some exceptions to this, um, but basically what it means is that if you're just sitting in your living room watching TV and you, there's not a warrant out for your arrest, the police cannot just come kick your door in and just place you under arrest, search your house, go through your stuff, because that would be an unreasonable search and seizure. And so now, for example, there are some exceptions to this, however. So if a police officer, say, knocks on your door and you open the door and you just talk to the police officer and in the background, if in a person's house there's something illegal that the officer sees in plain sight, then that can be an exception here. Um, but that's basically what it does. It protects against unreasonable searches and seizures here. All right, and so let's look at the text here. So it says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue. And it goes on to say, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So we're now moving on to the Fifth Amendment, which is very famous and we often see the Fifth Amendment in, this comes up a lot in different crime shows. So you'll often see like in a crime TV show or in a movie where someone's under arrest and the officer tells them you have the right to remain silent. So that's what the Fifth Amendment does among other things. So one thing that the Fifth Amendment does is it makes sure that there's a grand jury for criminal charges. So what is a grand jury? Well, simply put, a grand jury is a group of people who decide if criminal charges should be brought against somebody. So it's not just going to be one person making the decision. 
So what, what does the right to remain silent really mean? Well, it means that if you're suspected of a crime, you have the right to remain silent. And the right to remain silent just means that you can refuse to answer questions. You have the right to refuse to answer questions if you believe that your answers might make you seem guilty. And this is often called taking the fifth. So we see in legal shows, people might say, I plead the fifth. What that means is that they are refusing to answer a question because, or a series of questions they're refusing to answer because they believe their answers might make them seem guilty. Whether they're innocent or not, they can still have that right to refuse to answer questions. Okay, and, and then there's also the double jeopardy clause, which prevents the government from prosecuting you multiple times for the same offense, and you're also not going to get multiple punishments for the same offense. So, for example, if somebody has been acquitted of a charge, so basically that means if they've gotten off, then that person can't be tried again for the same charge, even if there's damning evidence of it. So, for example, let's say that somebody is accused of shoplifting and they get taken to court, and so in court they are acquitted of the charge, so they get off for that charge of shoplifting, and then later on it turns out that there's video evidence that shows them and the evidence shows that they they did the shoplifting all right no matter how damning that evidence may be then the person can't be tried again for that charge so once you get off for a crime you can't be prosecuted again for that same crime due to the double jeopardy clause here that is given to us in the fifth amendment of the bill of rights and so that the text for the Bill of Rights for number five, the Fifth Amendment, is rather lengthy. So if you want to check that out on your own, I encourage you to do so. But we're going to move right on to the Sixth Amendment, which guarantees the right to a speedy and public trial. So what does that mean? Well, the speedy is hopefully pretty self-explanatory. It means that, that criminal defendants have the right to have a fast trial and also the trial is going to be conducted public, publicly by an unbiased jury. And what do we mean by jury here? Well, the jurors have to be made up in from your local area, basically. So from the state and district in which the alleged crime was committed. So let's say that you break the law in Florida, but you're from a different state. Well, then the trial is going to be in the state and in the district where that crime was committed. So you're not, if you're, you say you live up in New York and, well, not you, because I'm sure nobody watching this video breaks the law, right? But let's say it's somebody different. So let's say that a person is being charged of a crime in, say, Florida, but they live in New York. So they're not going to be tried in New York. It's going to be all right, the jurors are going to be from the state and the district where that alleged crime was committed. So let's look at the text here. So it says, In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. Moving on to Amendment 7. So the Seventh Amendment protects the right to trial by jury in civil cases. So what's the difference between a civil case and a criminal case? So we've already been talking about criminal cases a little bit. And so basically a criminal case is when someone is being charged with a crime. So like murder or burglary or arson. Okay, the person's being charged with a crime and that is a criminal case. But in a civil case, there's a dispute between one person and another person. It could also be a, a dispute between a, a person and an organization. So for example, there once was a woman and she went to McDonald's and ordered coffee and she got burned by the coffee and so she sued McDonald's. All right, so that's an example of a civil case that was a dispute between a private citizen who was the woman who got burned by the coffee and McDonald's who was the organization that she was suing here. Okay, so that's what a civil case is, and the Seventh Amendment protects the right to trial by jury in these civil cases, and it also present, prevents re-examination or revisiting after the trial by jury is completed. So that is the Seventh Amendment, so let's look at the text. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, which $20 doesn't sound like that much money anymore, but that's what it says in the, in the Bill of Rights, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Okay, so let's keep moving here. So with the Eighth Amendment. So the Eighth Amendment protects against excessive bails and fines and also against cruel and unusual punishments. So this is hopefully pretty self-explanatory. 
and the text states that excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. So hopefully this one is straightforward. It pretty much means exactly what it sounds like. So let's talk about the Ninth Amendment now. So the Ninth Amendment protects against infringement of unenumerated rights. So what are these unenumerated rights? Well, basically, they're rights that are implied by other rights. So they're not stated directly in the Constitution, but they're implied. So it basically means that, hey, rights that are implied by the Constitution but that aren't stated directly are going to be protected here. So one example of this could be the right to vote. So there isn't an amendment that directly says, hey, the right to vote is protected here, okay, but it's implied from the other rights that in the United States we have the freedom and the right to vote. So that's an example here of the Ninth Amendment. So the text reads, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Okay, we're up to the Tenth Amendment now. So the Tenth Amendment says basically that powers not given or prohibited by the Constitution are given to the states. So the federal government is limited to the powers granted by the Constitution, right? So let's. So one example of this could be seatbelt laws. And I also talked about this in my Constitution video, but basically there is no federal seatbelt law in the United States. Now, in New Hampshire, there is not a seatbelt law that's enforced. So if you drive around in New Hampshire without your seatbelt on, well, it's not a good idea and you can get in, you're at risk of serious bodily harm or death if you get in an accident without your seatbelt on. There is no law in New Hampshire that's going to be enforced. So if you get pulled over without your seatbelt on, you're not breaking the law technically for, you might be breaking the law for speeding or, or for whatever reason why you're getting pulled over for, but you're not breaking the law by not having your seatbelt on. However, if you drive across the border of New Hampshire, let's say you go up to Maine or you go to Vermont and you cross the border without your seatbelt on, as soon as you get into Vermont or into whatever other state you're going to, you are now breaking the law if you don't put your seatbelt on because in other states, we do they do have a seatbelt law that is enforced. So again, that's an example of a law that is enforced at the state level. So different states can differ in how they enforce the seatbelt laws or they don't have to enforce them. Okay, so again, the 10th Amendment, what it does is it says that powers that aren't given or prohibited by the Constitution go to the states. All right, and let's look at the text here. So it says the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people here. All right, so that's the end of the video. I really hope that this video was helpful. Your next step, if you haven't done so already, is to make sure that you've seen my video on the Constitution. That's going to help you understand this, and it's going to make a lot more sense. Thank you so much for watching. This is Parker from Test Prep Champions, and I'm wishing you the best of luck on your 10th.